Hello everyone, today I'm working on a walk-in cooler that's temping at 52 Fahrenheit. So let's pull up our charts and go see what's going on. All right, so we're gonna pull up our checks before gauging up refrigeration chart and practice makes perfect. We're gonna follow the same routine every single time. It's literally gonna be drilled in your head. Why? So that we do not make mistakes. We're gonna check, is our evaporator coil frozen? Are our evaporator fan motors running? And do we have power at our solenoid? All right, so let's go into our box here. We have three evaporator fan motors. They're all running basically at the same speed. Fan blades are not noisy, don't seem to be broken or anything. No icing on the evaporator coil. Little bit of frosting on our distributor. And we do have power here at our solenoid. My tool's just a little bit broken. So let's head back to our before gauging up refrigeration chart. Um, it's important that we follow the steps here because our condensing unit on this one's probably close to 100 feet away. You don't want to be going back and forth from the coil to the condensing unit. So you want to do all your checks in one area, move your tools to the other area, and don't be going back and forth. All right, so we checked off all these items. Let's move on to the next items now, which is, is the condenser coil dirty and is the compressor running? So let's hop up here, our condenser coil, it's a little bit dirty, but not enough to have our temperature at 52 Fahrenheit, but we'll get that cleaned. Our two fans are running. So next thing would be to check the sight glass and look at that, we do not have a sight glass. So guess what, we're gonna have to gauge up. Good thing we know what our saturation temperatures need to be, so we don't need a sight glass. We can figure this out on our own. All right, so let's pull up an R22 PT chart and let's figure out what our pressures and saturation temperatures need to be. So in order to figure out our suction pressure, we simply take our current box temperature and we're gonna subtract our EVAP TD. So our current box temp was 52 Fahrenheit and our EVAP TD, because it is a walk-in cooler, is gonna be approximately 10 Fahrenheit, but it's gonna be set by our superheat. So that gives us 42 Fahrenheit. So that is our saturation temperature. So that's what we wanna focus on, but um, we'll still go use the chart, but really you don't need the chart. You just need to know your saturation temperatures. Where we need the chart is because we wanna figure out if we have high pressure, low pressure, but you could use you know, high temperature, low saturation temperature. It's all the same. So if we go look up 42 Fahrenheit, that's giving us 71 PSI. And for our head pressure, we just simply take our ambient and we're gonna add our engineered condenser split, which in our case is a 30 Fahrenheit condenser split. So we have a brown 70 Fahrenheit. We're gonna add 30 Fahrenheit and that's gonna give us 100 Fahrenheit. 100 Fahrenheit gives us 195 PSI. All right, so let's head over to our refrigeration cycle chart. And we're looking for 70 PSI on the low side, we're getting 26. And on our high side, we're looking for 195 PSI, we're only getting 138 PSI. So what does that mean? Low suction, low head pressure. So now we're gonna pull up our refrigeration high-low chart. And we have low suction, low head, that means we have two issues, either low on charge or a restriction. So in this case, we do not have a sight glass. So we potentially have a restriction. So how would we determine if we had a restriction? We would dump in more of the charge. In our case, we're using R22. We're probably low anywhere from five to 10 pounds. We start dumping in this R22, it could get very expensive if we're low on charge. So this is one of the seldom times you'll see me go hunt a leak before we rule out that we have a restriction. But due to the cost of R22, we just don't have a choice. So let's go do if a we leak don't find test. a leak, then we'll rule out the restriction. All right, so we're gonna do a leak test. Let's start by equalizing the system. 100 pounds of pressure. That's more than enough to find this leak. Let's go to our usual, usual suspects. So flare joints, king valve, etc., etc. So we do not have a leak at the condensing unit. Let's go hit up this evaporator coil. I like to start with the U-bends all the time. I'm just gonna fast forward this part. Um, I'm not actually testing it this quickly, you know, just to make the video go by a little bit quicker. 
make it not as boring so no leaks at the back of the coil so far so good like I said we may have a restriction okay and that's gonna get complicated cuz R22 is just so expensive at the moment but let's hope we don't get to that and we're gonna keep going here U bends we're good and we're gonna come to our TXV and we definitely have a hit here at the TXV look at that right at the top of our distributor here and we're gonna do a little soap test and right around one o'clock we have a leak on this distributor and let's try to zoom in here and that's probably as good as I'm gonna get it right there okay so there's the leak we're gonna attempt to braze that alright let's continue with our leak test and we're gonna come to our solenoid here and we're getting a hit on our solenoid as well so we have two leaks that we have found and let's throw some bubbles on there and we have a leak at this solenoid this is going to be an issue repairing this leak. alright so we need to replace our liquid line solenoid why I'm saying that's gonna be an issue is because I want to save the refrigerant so I could potentially recover the refrigerant but there's a way to park the refrigerant in the system so that we can do a repair on the low side so I went over this in one of my previous videos probably three four videos again but the issue with parking it is we're still going to have refrigerant right here at the liquid line solenoid. So let's just go over how the liquid line solenoid works. So this valve will close. The refrigerant will pump this way, this way, and to here. And then we're obviously going to come through this way and we're going to park ourselves in the receiver. So that means this section here and this section here no longer has refrigerant in it. Which means where do we have refrigerant? In this line here this line here and this line here well guess what we're trying to change this component right here so if we try to remove this all this refrigerant is going to leak out on us so like I said we're trying to avoid recovering all this refrigerant we want to save everything in the system so we have an option B and that's to use the receiver and the king valve to pump down so if I fully front seat the king valve well, that means we're going to pump down through all here and all these sections here are no longer going to have refrigerant and then we're going to come right here to our suction valve we're going to close that off we're going to have refrigerant remaining in only this section and this section here so anything after the king valve will not have refrigerant which means we can now replace our liquid line solenoid and we've parked all of the refrigerant in this section here and this section right here all right so that was a lot to take in but here's our receiver right here so if we front seat this valve there won't be refrigerant in any of these lines okay so we're in pump down right now with the solenoid only so that means anything after the solenoid won't have refrigerant so we still have refrigerant just before the solenoid so we're going to front seat this king valve very quickly here all right so we're there we're fully front seated and now it's gonna pump down the entire system and we're only gonna have refrigerant in our discharge and part of our liquid line up to the receiver so we're gonna pump it down to zero all right so we're good here we're gonna turn off our system and we're going to go right here to our suction valve and I front seated that as well which parks all the refrigerant so now we no longer have refrigerant in any of these lines going to the evaporator coil and back to the compressor as you can see we have zero PSI alright so I've completed the repairs we're going to crack open this king valve just so we can get a little bit of refrigerant so there's our new liquid line solenoid we now have refrigerant into the solenoid we want to put the magnet on there now we'll have refrigerant flowing to our expansion valve okay so that means we can perform a leak test all right so we got this soldered up as best as we could and let's test for leaks looks like we're all good here on the distributor I really hit this up pretty good and let's go check our liquid line solenoid make sure our nylog our flare fittings are not leaking we are all good here all right time to fire up the unit we're charged up and look at that we have a sight glass now Wow, what a difference, okay? So, sight glass is full. 
All right, so 71 ambient. What's our saturation on our high side? 101, that's a 30 split. Saturation on our low side, 33. We're getting 45 box temperature. That is a 12 split. All right, so we're off by just a little bit here. This expansion valve is super old. I don't even know if you can adjust this one. I'm not even going to attempt. We obviously want to get closer to a 10 split. So our final temperature, 35 Fahrenheit. Okay, we've cycled off and 22 Fahrenheit. All right, so let's go see what pressures we're actually looking for. So we had a 35 Fahrenheit box temp. We're gonna subtract our superheat or EVAP TD, which gives us 25 Fahrenheit. Okay, we had 22 Fahrenheit saturation. So if we go 35 Fahrenheit minus 22 Fahrenheit, that would give us a 13 Fahrenheit superheat or TD. But really when we're measuring on the copper, it's usually gonna be one degree higher. So this becomes a 12 Fahrenheit superheat TD and we're running about 100 feet so this may have gone up an extra degree. Now I can't check the superheat at the condenser because I can't gauge up there, but we're at a 12 Fahrenheit superheat or a 12 Fahrenheit TD, approximately. I want it to be 10. I'm not gonna mess around with this valve, especially if I can't take my suction pressure right at the coil. So we're going to live with our 12 Fahrenheit TD. The box is cooling really well. Um, in any other case, in the other videos you see, I like to adjust this to, you know, somewhere around 8 to 10 superheat on these walk-in coolers. Um, this thing's super old. We're going to have efficiency issues regardless. The customer didn't want to put a new system in. Uh, they were quoted that. This repair was probably 25% of putting in a new system, so they went with the repair. But we can live with our 12 Fahrenheit TD slash superheat. The last thing we're gonna do is just do a quick leak test on these valves that I opened up and we're all good, no leaks, we are good to go. 